everybody and welcome to Creepy Knitting. My name is Bernadette and this is my little corner of the internet where I knit and I talk about true crime. This week we're talking about a pretty iconic case. Um, we're talking about the case of Leopold and Loeb. After researching the case I don't understand why it is iconic besides like legal precedent that it would have set. I have a lot of feelings about it. <laughs> we'll quickly talk about what I'm knitting. I'm knitting something different um, for once <laughs> than my advent blanket just because this is very close to being done and I didn't have anything finished for the podcast so I need to for next time so these are very close to being done these are the pattern is jewels uh, by sorry Norland and it's just kind of like this uh, woven kind of slip stitch texture uh, just toe up uh, the crazy speckle yarn is black cat custom yarns and then this is just Cascade Heritage in Citron. Um, I'll put all the information down in the description box in case you want more information or if I talk too fast. <laughs> um, that information will be down there in the description box. There will also be links to find me other places on the internet if you want to go find me in those other places. Both Nathan Leopold and Robert Loeb were sons of rich uh, Chicago families. They'd known each other most of their lives. Um, kind of grew up in the same sort of circles, even though there was a slight age difference. They were both quite gifted intellectually, so moved along a lot faster than the rest of their peers. So Nathan Leopold was a child prodigy. He claimed to have spoken his first words at four months. At the time they committed their murder, Leopold had completed an undergraduate degree at the University of Chicago. He apparently had also studied 15 languages and claimed to speak five of them fluently. He also reached a pretty high level of recognition as an ornithologist. Nathan Leopold was born on November 19th 1904 and then Richard Loeb was born June 11th 1905. Richard Loeb's father was the retired president of Sears Roebuck and Company. Loeb skipped several grades and was the University of Michigan's youngest graduate at the age of 17. Loeb although intellectually gifted didn't really want to like look into intellectual pursuits as much as Leopold did but both were quite intellectually gifted. Loeb also seems to have very strong ties to his governess. Uh, the two young men grew up with their respective fam families in the affluent Kentwood neighborhood on Chicago's south side. The Loeb's apparently owned a house, well a mansion apparently, in Kenwood that was two blocks from the Leopold home, so like I said, very close. So yeah, Leopold and Loeb casually knew each other while they were growing up because a small circle of rich people in Chicago south side, you would know everybody. Um, I'm imagining Gossip Girl, but with a lot more flapper dresses. Um, <laughs> their relationship really flourished when both of them ended up at the University of Chicago, especially after, after they discovered they had a mutual interest in crime, which um, I think is an experience all of us have had. Leopold was particularly fascinated by Nietzsche's concept of the Superman slash Ubermensch. It was a philosophical idea that some people were not bound by society's laws because they were superior to the rest of society. Both Leopold and Loeb, being rich, intelligent white men, <laughs> thought that they were. I have a lot of feelings about this case, like I said before, and the fact that two <laughs> rich white dudes thought they were better than everyone else is hilarious to me. The two of them began to like assert their perceived immunity based around this theory, starting with acts of like theft and vandalism, just small things just dipping their toes into the crime pool, if you will. They initially stole pen knives, a camera, and a typewriter from, from Leopold's fraternity. And they, of course, didn't get caught for this. So that to them proved that their theory of the Superman was right. They wanted to push the ante even more. One of the things that they progressed to was arson, um, but like no one seemed to notice any of these small crimes. I don't know if it was Chicago in the 20s and maybe they had other stuff going on and they're like, a fire? most of the city is wood like it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter particularly i don't know but like leopold and loeb really wanted attention for the crimes that they were committing they decided to up the ante even more since none of their crimes were working and they wanted to commit the perfect crime and as we go you will understand why i'm quoting this because <laughs> it is the worst like put together crime i have seen um having <laughs> read a lot of true crime which apparently these guys did not read enough of they're just dropping the ball 
in multiple places. And I'm just amazed at how badly it went for two people who thought they were extremely intelligent, which is why I think it's weird that this is the case that everyone's just like, that gets so much hype. They did a very bad job at the crime portion of it. Their lawyer was amazing, <laughs> but the crime, so badly done. Um, okay, so first part of this crime that is very badly planned um, was the victim. Uh, the victim was Bobby Franks. Bobby Frank was Leopold's second cousin and they lived um, across the street from each other. Problem number one with this crime is that they intimately knew the victim. Rule number one is don't kill someone that you know. Maybe true crime back in the 20s wasn't as in depth. Maybe they weren't like, we're gonna set people up for good murder. They spent seven months planning everything out um, from the method of abduction to disposal of the body to like kind of confuse people about the nature of the crime. They decided to write a ransom note and devise like an intricate plan for collecting the ransom. For said ransom note, they actually used the typewriter that they had previously stolen. They didn't need to, but you can have the type of typewriter tracked. So I don't know how, like when it comes to a ransom no, I think the only way you could really get away with it is like using a bunch of newspapers or like magazines from all over the place and like using a glue that was like pretty generic that you could get anywhere. I think that's the only way and then making sure you obviously don't like touch it or like leave fingerprints that you could actually leave a ransom note because like they can track down a typewriter. If you bought a typewriter that's kind of unique, they'll be able to find out who purchased said typewriter. There's no winning, but the typewriter was directly tied to them. They weren't caught for the theft, but they could have easily pieced it together, I'm sure. And for some reason a chisel was selected as the murder weapon which I don't understand a very weird choice I couldn't find information on why they chose a chisel over like a knife um, or a gun or like strangling just like it's a weird very bloody choice for people who are trying to commit the perfect crime so if you're killing someone with a lot of blood, you're gonna have to get rid of the blood and you're gonna have to clean it up. It's like a whole thing. This is why I don't think this is very well planned. So in the afternoon of May 21st, 1924, uh, Leopold and Loeb kind of put their plan into motion to kidnap and kill Bobby Franks for giggles. Leopold rented a car um, under the name of Morton D. Billard, which I think is one of the few smart moves. They have smart moves occasionally, but like renting a car under a fake name, good move. In said rented car, uh, they are driving around, they see Bobby Franks walking around, um, and they ask him if he wants a ride home. He's only two blocks from his house, so he he's like, nah, I'm good, thanks though. But they entice him into the car by like showing off their new tennis racket. Bobby would come and play tennis over at the Loeb's house, so um, the tennis lore makes more sense. It's not just like, you're rich and white, you must like tennis rackets. Once Bobby Franks was in the car, Loeb struck Bobby, who was sitting in front of him in the passenger seat, several times in the head with the chisel, and then dragged him into the back seat and gagged him um, where he died. So there's like a ton of blood all over this car and a dead body now in the back seat. They proceeded to drive the body out to their predetermined dumping spot, which was near Wolf Lake in Hammond, Indiana, which was 25 miles south of Chicago. After nightfall, they discarded Frank's clothing and concealed the body in a culvert along the Pennsylvania railroad tracks, uh, which was north of the lake. To obscure the body's identity, they used hydrochloric acid. Um, on the way out to dump the body, they also stopped to get sandwiches <laughs> with the body just in the back seat because they stopped for sandwiches and because of a bunch of other moves there are a ton of witnesses that placed them going towards this body at the time of the murder when i was doing my research it was like 80 to 100 witnesses which is just perfection and just like really like even in the 20s that's a thing that you would know to not do. The men return to Chicago and then Leopold calls Bobby's mom, identifying himself as George Johnson. He told her that her son had been kidnapped and instructions for delivering the ransom would follow. They mailed the ransom note. He also burned their bloodstained clothing and then tried to clean the bloodstains from the rear seat of the vehicle. Apparently though, one of their drivers saw them cleaning the back seat and they just kind of brushed it off as being wine. We didn't think through the bloodstains in the rented car. After they dealt with all their evidence, lied to their driver, they spent the rest of the evening playing cards, which like, what else are you gonna do? <laughs> seems fair. Read a book, I guess. Anything would have seemed weird. Um, there's no activity that after committing a murder and waiting for a ransom seems normal. There's nothing they could be doing. <laughs> the next day, the Franks received 
the ransom note um, in the morning. Leopold called a second time pretending to be George Johnson again and dictated the first set of instructions for ransom payment. The intricate plan uh, stalled apparently almost immediately when a nervous family member forgot the address of the store where he was supposed to receive the next set of directions and it was abandoned entirely when the word came that Frank's body had been found. So we have less than 24 hours and their body has already been found from the culvert. So our predetermined hiding spot wasn't that good. Our attempt to obscure the identity of the victim, also not very good. So the police obviously launched an intense investigation into the murder. The body of a child was found. It's a logical thing to do. Loeb just went about like his daily routine, like everything was normal, but Leopold went and freely talked to the police. So Leopold like freely spoke to the police and even offered them like theories about who could have possibly committed the murder. Um, they did try at some point to pin it on uh, another ornithology student, but they found a pair of eyeglasses on Bobby Frank's body. So the glasses themselves, totally average, like nothing interesting about them, but the hinge on the glasses apparently was unique to three pairs of glasses that had been sold in the Chicago area. One was out of town, one had a solid alibi, and the other one was Leopold. <laughs> I didn't know that the hinges on glasses um, are unique in any way, shape or form. I just assumed they were the same based on the frame, but like this could also be a 1920s issue. Like I got my glasses from the internet. I doubt very highly that the hinge in my glasses is unique. Leopold reasoning as to why his glasses would be there is because the area was used for bird watching a lot. And he was like, oh, maybe they fell out of my pocket when I was bird watching last weekend or something. The two men were summoned in for formal questioning on May 29th, 1924. They asserted that the night of the murder, they had picked up two women in Chicago using Leopold Leopold's car, dropped them off sometimes late, sometime later near a golf course without learning their last name. Their alibi was exposed as fabrication because Leopold's chauffeur was uh, working on Leopold's car, so he could not have been using it at the time to pick up women. They also recovered the destroyed typewriter, which Leopold and Loeb um, had dropped in Jackson Park Lagoon. Because what ended up happening is after Leopold and Loeb confessed, they drew the cops a map as to like where everything was and when things happened and they like walked them through it. Loeb confessed first. Um, he asserted that Leopold had planned everything and had killed Franks in the backseat of the car while Loeb drove. Once Leopold found out that Loeb has, had confessed, he confessed quickly after. He insisted that he had been driving and Loeb had been the murderer. There is some circumstantial evidence for uh, Loeb having struck the final blows, but there is also a eyewitness statement from someone who saw Loeb driving and Leopold in the backseat minutes before the kidnapping. Who knows who did what? Both Leopold and Loeb admitted that they were driven by their thrill-seeking ubermensch delusions um, and their aspiration to commit the perfect crime, which as we can tell, they were very far from doing. <laughs> If they had, we wouldn't be talking about this. The trial for this, I think, is the reason that everything kind of stands out. Um, the trial became like a really big media circus in Cook County in Chicago. It was the front page for most newspapers for like the first little bit. Heck, it was the front page for a Montreal newspaper in 1924. It was uh, compared to like the OJ trial before OJ's trial was a thing. Bean has come to help me again. Bean, that's a cactus. Hello, madam. Uh, because of the status of Leopold and Loeb in the Chicago community and the amount of money that their families made, they were able to get a very famous and very, very talented lawyer to help them with the situation. They hired Clarence Darrow, who is said to be the lawyer for the damned. It was rumored that he was paid a uh, million dollars for his services, but he was actually paid 70000 but still, it's equivalent to a million dollars in 2020. <laughs> so Darrow only took the case because he was a staunch opponent of the death penalty. Obviously these two, because of the uh, the fact they'd killed someone, were possibly going to get the death penalty. The It was generally assumed that the boys would plead guilty by reason of insanity. Darrow was pretty sure that if they also did plead um, guilty by reason of insanity, that a jury trial would end in the conviction um, of the two, which would lead to a death penalty. Instead, Darrow entered a plea of guilty, hoping to convince uh, the judge to impose um, sentences of life imprisonment. Because um, apparently if you pled guilty, you didn't have to go through a jury trial. The trial, which is technically the sentencing hearing, ran for 32 days. The state's attorney presented over a hundred witnesses documenting the details of the crime. So like I said, not we didn't try very hard. Uh, Darrow presented extensive psychiatric testimony in an effort to establish 
that the boys had mitigating circumstances for why they would have committed the crime, like childhood neglect and the fact that they were children the era post-World War I. They grew up in a world, he was arguing that the idea of neglect and growing up in a post-World War I world left them in a place where killing would have been a not unusual thing for them to try and do, which is ridiculous because they were children and they didn't actually fight in a war. If they had like PTSD or shell shock at the time, then I could see that, but no. So Darrow's final speech in the trial is one of the reasons I think that this case is still stuck around. Um, it was impassioned in a 12 hour masterful plea. The theme of the whole thing was that the punishments of the American justice system were inhumane. He also spoke to the youth and immaturity of the boys. The speech is on the internet if you wanted to go give it a read. It is, I heard snippets when I was doing my research and it's, it's very interesting. It's a good, um, good bit of lawyering. With that 12 hour speech, the judge was actually persuaded, but he explained that his ruling was a decision based off of the age of Leopold and Loeb and not so much off of uh, the mitigating circumstances. On September 10th, 1924, he sentenced both Leopold and Loeb to life imprisonment for the murder. And they attacked on an additional 99 years for the kidnapping. They were initially held together in the same prison. They tried to keep them apart, but the men apparently kept in touch. And then eventually they were both transferred to Stateville Penitentiary. The reason I'm mentioning this at all is apparently once they were reunited at Stateville Penitentiary, they expanded the uh, the prison school system, adding a high school and junior college curriculum, which is just so weird. But I imagine it probably tied into their intellectual superiority and I bet you they were super bored. Loeb died in prison in January of 1936 when he was attacked by a fellow inmate. The prisoner who assaulted him claimed that he had been attacked by Loeb first, but he had no defensive wounds and Loeb had 50 stab wounds on him. Leopold lived out his life in prison. He apparently had also like, he was trying to make good use of his time in prison. He also volunteered for a malaria study, which is interesting. He said that his good work in prison and after his release was an effort to compensate for the evil of his crime. Leopold apparently actually published his memoir while still in prison. Published his memoir in 1956. It was written by someone else, so they portrayed Leopold under a pseudonym. It was called Compulsion. Leopold's autobiography, Life Plus 99 Years, was published in 1958. It was part of his campaign to win parole. After 33 years in prison, Leopold was paroled in March of 1958. He apparently went to go work in Puerto Rico as a medical tech through a like church sponsored program. He did move permanently to Puerto Rico and he married a florist. I wonder how much she knew about his life. And then he died of a diabetes related heart attack on August 29th of 1971 at the age of 66. All things considered that could have been a lot worse for him. Like 33 years in prison for murder it's not bad. Although as I'm saying that, I'm like, how many years did Carla Homolka get? So that's their story. Can you say hello, Bean? Hello, Bean. <laughs> <laughs> Just melting. Yeah. So that's the story of Leopold and Loeb. I should look into how many like true crime aficionados have like gone off to try and commit the perfect crime and then like have clearly like just bumbled it along the way. I think a lot of us think that we would commit the perfect, you know, we'd forget something, we'd touch something, leave a hair at the scene, something. You'd be like, this thing is generic. And then like somehow it has a serial number and then you're hooped. But 1924, it should have been a lot easier. So I'm, I'm disappointed. Let me know what you guys think. Am I just jaded about true crime? Do you guys think this is interesting? Am I missing some incredibly huge detail that makes this a fascinating case besides the lawyering. I'm not an expert in law, so I didn't want to go into too much detail about that. But if you're really interested, there's a lot of really great stuff out there. That's all I have to ramble about. <laughs> Hopefully my feelings weren't too tremendously offensive. I hope you're healthy and happy and that your crafting is bringing you joy. And I will see you back here next week for more true crime and knitting. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.